50th anniversary is often called the golden anniversary, one to signify lifelong love. It's a befitting milestone for World Challenge, which was founded on a passion for the lost and has been driven by a desire to help the suffering. In these 50 years, David Wilkerson and Gary Wilkerson have gone to hundreds of conferences and evangelistic rallies, sent out over 700 newsletters, and touched millions of lives. Everything that World Challenge has done over the decades has been a work of passion, a lifelong response to God's call to love the lost and help the hurting. What would you do if God called you to leave your home right now and reach the unwanted? This is the call David Wilkerson answered when he went to New York City. This sprawling metropolis was, and still is, an intimidating blend of racial tensions and clashing ideologies. Regardless, it was here that the Holy Spirit called David Wilkerson and caused his path to cross with Nikki Cruz. New York was saturated with so many uh, people coming from different countries and nationalities. And when I came in, it was wor the worst time that New York went through, the gangs. And that was a matter of survival if, if you was a young person. And that's the reason uh, I have no other choice but to, 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 to join the gangs, which it was like a family. And we was very loyal. We, we stick together, we have principles. We was ready to die for our neighborhood, for our turf. You got a, a racial problem. And we, we were killing one another. There was no guarantee when you go across, and just cross to another neighborhood that you want to come back. For our part, as far as the young, the kids or the adolescents were concerned, it was constant warfare. Uh, there were many, many gangs. And it might be said that gangs uh, were the main problem in East Harlem then. There was much bloodshed. And the ironic thing is that the only thing that united Italians and Puerto Ricans together uh, were, was the use of drugs. Dio Moody said the world has yet to see what God can do through one man wholly committed to him. David Wilkerson was probably one of the closest people that I knew that fit that description, wholly committed. Wilkerson was a strange man. To have this man come in from a little town to one of the largest city of this country, New York, and to walk in straight to my neighborhood, little that I know, here is face to face with me. He was the first one who, t who told me I came, I came here to give you a message from heaven. Nikki, Jesus love you. And I got upset and I spit at him and I push him. And there's about 300 people around. And I curse him. I curse God, I mean, if you began to put it in, in the dictionary, it was in the X book, the triple X. And there, here I'm mean, on his face. He is literally, I, I look at his eye, he was concerned, he was, this is, this is, I'm gonna meet my Lord. And out of the blue sky, it, it's happened so fast, I saw with my own eyes that tremendous change and boldness came upon him. And there he, he screamed so loud, and there was about 300 people there, screamed so loud to me, kill me. I said, what? Go ahead, kill me. If this is make you feel good, do it. And I'm looking around, 
go ahead. Nikki, you can kill me and cut me in thousand pieces. You can throw them right there on the street. But remember every little piece going to cry out to you that Jesus loves you. He disarmed me right there. I cursed him, I said, go to hell, and I walk away with my girlfriend. Two weeks later, I got converted. I could not get that man out of my, my mind. His face was right in front of me. Jesus love you, Jesus love you, Jesus love you. And that was the convicting power of the Holy Ghost. David Wilkerson's ministries on the streets began to pick up momentum as volunteers came and support began to pour in. David's heart, though, wasn't satisfied. He felt like God was calling for more. David Wilkerson had a singular focus on transforming lives through the message and mission of Jesus Christ. He founded World Challenge in 1971 to minister to the physical and spiritual needs of people, both in the United States and internationally. In the 70s, he got this vision of a ministry located in the central United States. It was in Dallas, Texas, um, wanting to be there so that he could uh, travel easily to various locations. At the time, he was very concerned about the trajectory of the United States, where, where it was going. It was on the heel ends of sort of the, the the 60s that was pretty radical, and he was speaking to the Black Panthers, he was speaking to the drug addicts that were on the streets, he was speaking to the runaway kids that were living in vans and in the, in the, in the streets of San Francisco, and so, um, and he was still involved in New York City. So Dallas became sort of the headquarters, and World Challenge was launched out of that. When I came to join him in 1970, that was kind of right at a time of transition, it had actually begun before that, but drugs initially were very much only an inner city problem. But then drugs went everywhere, you know, especially in the mid 60s. A lot of people will point to 1965, height of the Vietnam War, hippie start, and you know, everybody, the, the youth culture is anti everything, it seems, establishment, uh, anti war, anti just. Uh, you know, drop out of society and start dropping drugs was kind of a thing. So it spread like a cancer suddenly all over the country. He really felt the need as, as, the, as the problem spread, the need was we've got to address this now. Now it's a whole different animal. It's not just an inner city issue, it's a national issue, it's a worldwide issue. It's not just hitting the poverty class, it's hitting the upper class, it's hitting everybody. So he developed that ministry to address the problem that was very, very obvious, the crusade style ministry. He was doing probably you know, 14, 15, what he called the David Wilson Crusades uh, per month. And he would travel, whether it be New York City or Terre Haute, Indiana. And uh, you know he got great response from that because they, they had less Christian events like that in the early 70s, again, so that, that's, that's why his ministry uh, um, became more well known. So when ministries like ours begin to think in terms of events, music events, uh, just come on out, you know, Brother Dave was very much, he didn't care, uh, you don't have to cut your hair before you come, you know, you don't have to look like this, don't, just come on, just come on, let me tell you about Jesus. So. It, it just was, you know, the need dictated that the ministry needed to change. I was probably 10, 12 at the time, and they could tell he was getting, he was getting uh, weary. He was getting a little bit more exhausted, a little, a little worn out. There came a point where, you know, he just said, is this all there is? Sort of just going from city to city and just talking to people and then leaving and, you know, am I making a real impact on them? And so he, he actually canceled all of his uh, um, evangelistic crusades. He probably canceled six months worth and just said, I'm gonna just shut myself in with God and, and pray. I'm gonna have my Bible and my my knees and be down in, in, on my face before God and just, you know, which is strange for me because he was already hitting on all cylinders. I mean, his messages were powerful and strong and to see a discontent in him, you know, I look back on that today and just go like, wow, that that says something. That, that could speak to our culture today, not to be satisfied because you have a pulpit or a platform, not to be satisfied because you've written a book or two and people are like giving you accolades for it, but, but say, you know, this isn't enough, there's, there's got to be more. 
1960s and 70s America seemed determined to shake off its historic Christian roots. The cost, however, was proving to be heavy, especially for those growing up in the middle of this chaos. Teens and young adults were turning away from God and turning to drugs, sex, and wild living. Many were hurt and confused. The freedom and peace that they'd been promised by the world was proving to be an illusion. They were desperate for hope. World Challenge and David Wilkerson's Youth Crusades were born out of that same Holy Spirit call to reach a generation in turmoil. The first crusade I ever went on, we started in Mobile, Alabama, went down to Jacksonville, Florida, and all of a sudden, I mean, I'd been singing little churches of 10 people. I'd been a youth pastor at a relatively small church. All of a sudden, I'm standing in front of three, four, 5,000 people night after night singing. And it was just such an amazing opportunity to get to minister to that many people and to see what God was doing in the lives of people. See, night after night, hundreds, if not thousands of people, young people, uh, weeping and crying and laying down their drugs and getting the life straightened out. Uh, it, it was a truly incredible time and that that always continued. We always saw the results of the ministry. I can't tell you how many hundreds if not thousands of cities he preached in night after night. You know, here you got 10,000 know, teenagers in early 20s in a room, some of them detoxing off drugs and uh, you know, that, and that's just totally silent, you know, nobody's moving. Uh, and just and then that uh, invitation to receive Christ and to see half the auditorium, you know, pack the front of the, you know, you couldn't even fit in the front. We'd go all the way down the aisleways and sometimes even up into the, you know, if it was like a stadium seating type thing, up in the stadium seating, it'd be kids packed in the aisles and they'd be weeping and crying and people throwing like, you know, joints or uh, bags of heroin up on the stage saying, I don't want to do this anymore. I want to get rid of it. I want to be free. Workers that were serving at, at altar calls or, you know, time of prayer for people after meetings, you know, they would, it's like, you know, this guy gave me this gun, you know, what do I, what do, I do with this guy, you know, or it, it was just kind of like, wow, okay, you know, I mean, this was immediate, you know, they were, they were hearing the message of Christ, they were being, you know, set free right then, and they were ready to leave their old life behind and move forward. I want every head bowed, every eye closed, not a sound made, please. Jesus, tonight in this building, and in the annex, there are people that face an hour of isolation and a night of confusion. Oh, God, we move on because even though we're unworthy, we know that Jesus is merciful and kind, and that he stands beside us. And standing in those shadows, Jesus stands with outstretched arms, saying, come unto me. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. There was a holy anointing on him to uh, penetrate. Uh, I think it would have had to do with what, you know, again, that's the, that fire shut up in his bones, that, that seriousness about getting a word from God. So when he stood in the platform, there was, there was real breakthrough. There was real transformation of, of lives. Very rarely do people come and say, I heard your dad, you know, speak in the late 60s and it was pretty good. You know, it was always just like uh, speaking of tremendous, tremendous changes that were taking place in, in people's lives. When David Wilkerson returned to New York City, he was heartbroken by the crime and addiction that had so violently taken root once again. Bundles of pure heroin with a street value of $70 million was seized from 15 locations in the Bronx and Queens. When we first came to New York City, um, interestingly enough, my wife Kelly and I lived in New York City uh, while my dad was still in Texas uh, leading World Challenge from our Texas office. We were doing some church planting in the different boroughs of New York City. We had a church plant in uh, Spanish Harlem, one in Brooklyn, uh, and one in Manhattan in the Lower East Side. And so uh, my father would come visit us and preach for us on some of our street meetings we were doing. When David came to New York, the New York that I grew up in, I wasn't allowed to come to Manhattan. I wasn't allowed to ride on the subway because of how dangerous it was. And here's my father as one of the New York City police chiefs. He was the chief of the transit, which was all the subway and the bus policemen. 
and I wasn't allowed to come to the city unless he was with me. And to see how dangerous it was and to see 42nd Street, which is considered the crown jewel of Times Square, they used to call it the shooting gallery. Um, and not for guns, but it was where all the drug addicts used to go and shoot up. And it had, you know, broken windows were the least of its problems. You know, the prostitutes in the windows, uh, drug dealers, you know, very loudly selling their wares uh, with a policeman standing next to them, like, hey, I got heroin here. I, got I watched iconic restaurants have to shut down because no tourists would, sh would, would show up there. Mama Leone's would, was a restaurant that was gone. All the Broadway theaters you'd see, not all, but you'd see, you know, um, more than half of them all closed down because people just wouldn't come to the city. And then as we walked down the street, I was walking down the street with my father and I noticed I could see something churning in his heart and his mind. You know, it certainly was prayer and the call of God, but emotionally, the, the, that the moment the thing snapped was that walk down 42nd Street where he saw the overwhelming needs of a city that was full of sin and corruption and hatred and pride and drugs and alcohol and sexual impurity and immorality and seemed like the government unable to even um, do anything about it if it cared at all. I remember after having a street rally in Brooklyn, uh, couldn't sleep and I got up around midnight I was right on the corner of uh, Broadway and 42nd Street, and I, I began to weep. And I cried, God, you have to raise up a testimony. That, that You have to raise up a church here in the middle of this as a witness. The Holy Spirit said clearly, you know the city. You've loved this city now. I want you to do it. And... Uh, <clears throat> That was the birth of Times Square Church. That was, that was the start of it. It was just that, that time, and I think it was the late 80s, and then he moved to New York, and uh, I, again, I was living there at the time, so we sort of um, collapsed our uh, church plants into one in the center there, plus, uh, uh, you know, my father's uh, notoriety uh, drew some people. So I think the first service had like 700 people in it, so a pretty good opening, and then just uh, began to grow uh, very rapidly after that. I heard with my own ears when Times Square Church was starting in the Nederlander Theater on 41st, I heard with my own words the, the announcement during the service that one of the pastors would come up and say, hey, if you own um, a white Chrysler, um, you know, other churches would say, hey, your lights are on, not at Times Square Church. They said, you better get out there now because they're taking the tires off your car. That would come from the pulpit. Um, and so that's this, that was the New York City that David Wilkerson came. It wasn't a New York City that was uh, bustling and, and was at its height. It, it's a New York City that really what we're seeing around us right now. The most dangerous of areas, police would be there to say, where are you going? You can't walk, don't go that way. Just stay right here, you're safe here and watch these uh, ferocious uh, young men, I can picture them in my mind right now, coming in out of the darkness and, and sitting there with their chains and, and just in their posture and then soften at the end, come down to me crying and seeking God. The, the power of God was all over Dave, always. There was always an anointing in the, and every altar service was an amazing experience. Yeah, I remember uh, Times Square Church started um, in Town Hall only for a, a few months. Finally, in 1989, Dave and I walked the streets with a realtor looking at different theaters. We walked into the Mark Hallinger, which is the flagship of all the Broadway theaters where Jesus Christ Superstar played. And we walked in and we felt like a couple of farm boys looking up at the gilded ceilings and always like, golly, <laughs> you know, we couldn't believe it. We walked in and said, yeah, that would really be nice, but it's not gonna happen. There was a show that was happening here um, called Legs Diamond. And that was the that was the last Broadway show that would be that would be here. Um, Brother Dave felt like that was the theater they were supposed to have, prayed that that, that, that would shut down. It shut down. And I remember hearing the story that uh, David went in to see if they would sell the theater and had a certain amount of dollars, but went with a businessman. And the owner said, um, 
yeah, it is It is this amount. And David said, I only have this. The next morning he calls me and after having a two or three hour conversation with God the night before, he said, God told me uh, that's our church and he's gonna provide the resources. And he did, unbelievable. I think uh, the obtaining of the Mark Hallinger Theater uh, for the my father's ministry of church planting there in Times Square Church uh, ha had various reasons for being significant. Um, one is just, um, it was one more um, it was one more statement that my father wanted to make that God is the God of the impossible. Uh, when the world says it can't be done, you know, drug addicts can't be set free from drugs. Gang members can't get set free from, from, from gangs. They're gonna die in, in prison or in, with a bullet in their head. Uh, he always loved to, to uh, by example, not just by word, say, you know, if, 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 if you think this is impossible, look, let's, let's watch and see what God could do. So. They bought the theater and opened up on the very on the very stage where Jesus Christ Superstar um, was was here, and the the lead of Jesus Christ Superstar that it was a very ungodly Broadway uh, production. Uh, Jeff Fenholt, who became a Christian, uh, came the opening day and even sang worship on the very stage that he mocked Jesus. When the church opened, I think, you know, what was dynamic for me was, I remember one time seeing a homeless guy, uh, you know, had all his bags and stuff, and, and uh, you know, not that you want somebody to fall asleep during your sermon, but my father's preaching, and I was on the side of the stage, and I noticed this guy had his stuff, and he was, he was, um, he had fallen asleep over, and there was a, a soldier, like a, uh, you know, a, a decorated soldier, he had uh, medals and stuff, you know, he had his full uniform on, and he was, the homeless guy had his uh, head leaning on the, the soldier's uh, arm, and the soldier was just like, love you, Jesus, praise God, you know, and, um, you know, and that was the, kind of encapsulated the launch to me is like uh, corporate business leaders, uh, actors, actresses from Broadway. People from all socioeconomic backgrounds, you'll have ambassadors and pro athletes to the homeless right off the street, which 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 made it amazing. And when you can see that begin to take place and the common ground being the gospel, the word being preached and the presence of God, that's when you know it's the presence of God. That's what you saw in the gospels, that every kind of person would begin to be attracted to Jesus. Not a certain color group, not a certain ethnicity, but people from every single background. And that's what made Times Square Church pretty amazing in the beginning and, and still has. After David established Times Square Church, he founded Mount Zion Bible College. He believed that young people needed to be built up in their faith and trained to be future leaders in their communities. World Challenge began to offer scholarships to students who wished to attend the college, which went on to be called Summit International School of Ministry. With ministry being my passion, I was already serving in high school at the local soup kitchen. I was serving at church in Sunday school. That was my heart, to live for the benefit of others. And I found Summit online, and I knew when I was in high school before I even graduated that that is the school that I wanted to go to. My youth pastor was a student at Summit, and he went to Times Square Church right after graduation in 2008. And there, Pastor David Wilkerson announced that he will be giving away some scholarships for the next incoming class at Summit. So I applied. I applied summer of 2008. In July, I had a letter in the mail. It stated that I had received the scholarship before I even got the acceptance letter. So I didn't even apply for the scholarship, but God knew and God opened the door and made a way for me to attend the Bible school. So when I was at Summit, I was asked to do an internship in Panama City, Florida. The children's pastor in Panama City that I interned under was also a graduate of Summit. He came out to Colorado Springs and worked at Springs Church, which was founded by Pastor Gary Wilkerson. Through connections and through my passion for ministry and um, just serving people around the world, when a position opened up at World Challenge, I accepted that offer that they extended to me. And I've grown at World Challenge from social media associate and now I get to serve God all over the world. The ministry that I specifically focus on is development work, where we teach them and train them to develop their communities, which is 
often an open door to do ministry that's spiritual. Too many times we forget to care for the people and teach them the same things that we know when it comes to alleviating poverty. Instead, we do for, and here I get to teach the people so that they could do for themselves what we could also do for them. While Teen Challenge was focused on helping those caught in the grip of drug or alcohol addiction, World Challenge was aimed at providing relief for those caught in poverty. Orphanages were built in slum areas where children had nowhere else to go. Food kitchens were set up and stocked for those who were going hungry. We saw uh, needs around us. We heard of needs, uh, even globally, from people that knew of World Challenge or had personal contacts in World Challenge. And World Challenge then would, as we're messaging, would see a need, try to meet a need. When David Wilkerson was starting to kind of get up in age and uh, he had done, you know, everything that uh, God had put in his heart and said, you know, God, what do you want me to do now? And in essence, uh, God told him, David, feed the poor. In a lot of these countries, we were giving out handouts, but we were not actually producing faith or confidence uh, or a sense that you know, God is the God of the impossible. Something that uh, Gary Wilkerson, um, uh, during a trip to Africa some years ago, uh, he noticed uh, the poverty uh, that was there and uh, looked, um, he, 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 he met a, a young boy, I believe, uh, as he tells the story, who um, were fe being fed through uh, one of our programs. You know, there's a line of people there and a you know, kid walked up and says like, oh, thank you for having this feeding program. I've been coming here for a number of years, getting my meals before I go to school and thank you for having this meal providing thing. And, and my father came here before me when he was younger. I was like, okay, we've been doing this thing for feeding program for 20 years now and now it's going to the second generation. And so you can see when you are in a situation where you, uh, you've come to help, uh, but you realize that uh, the situation hasn't changed. And um, it didn't seem healthy to me. It didn't seem like it was just, it wasn't, cha it wasn't changing uh, the fabric of the society or the culture or the family or the neighborhood or the community or the church's ability to see transformation taking place, not just on an individual level, but on a cultural level as well. And what came out of that was uh, quite a lot of research uh, uh, trying to understand, is there something we can do differently than just providing food and funds? In 2005, uh, the Lord answered our prayer about a different way by bringing us into um, contact with development ministry. And when we first heard that, I think we assumed it meant like maybe Maybe it was building infrastructure. Maybe it meant building orphanages or building churches or, you know, developing things. But as we found out, uh, the biblical concept of, of uh, development is building people. We try to look at the underlying issues of poverty and kind of get to the roots of, uh, of these issues uh, with the communities that, uh, and the churches that we're invited to work with. We would see some of the places where they hadn't started doing development. So we had an idea what it looked like. And then we would go back a few months later and we would go to those same places. It was very visible that something was happening and that was exciting. And we were able to see uh, many communities now that don't need feeding programs because um, they, they found farming skills, they started small uh, businesses, they found resources, they began to share with one another if a family was in a particular low point in crisis um, and the churches got involved, getting outside their four walls. So it had a, it had a, a, a you know, two-pronged impact. One is helping the poor, but it also awakened the church. And that's what we're about. We're to see uh, the transformation of lives and families and communities through the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we help individuals break the cycle of poverty, World Challenge did not want to forget about those who need immediate support. Often these are widows, orphans, refugees, or those with disabilities in countries that have limited or non-existent social services. Through the, the beauty of the heart of David Wilkerson, he just met needs. He didn't have a 12-step program that people had to qualify for or whatever. He, he just uh, saw a need and he said, we got to help them. Areas that where people needed mercy, you know, they needed a helping hand, they needed um, clothes, they needed food. So Mercy Ministries tries to go in and bring hope. Uh, we're not going to 
uh, revive everybody's economic situation, but we're gonna provide the hope that is eternal, and that is through Jesus. And so by sharing who Christ is, first off through tangible ways of, of meeting a need. So if there's somebody who uh, is in need of uh, some food, we'll bring food. If they're in need of some medicine, we'll provide for that. Uh, we've done cataract surgeries for widows who could no longer operate because they're, they could not see any longer. And then because of meeting those needs, um, it allows us to build relationship and establish trust with the individual. And so they welcome the volunteers into their homes. And then the volunteers begin to share with them about why we do what we do. And so we're able to bring the hope of Jesus to people who are living in utter despair and are, are literally surviving from day to day. In 2010, David Wilkerson passed the torch of World Challenge to his son, Gary Wilkerson, who is committed to ministering to believers. His heart is for those struggling in their view of God and questioning how our Father deals with the world. One way he reaches out is through weekly devotionals and a weekly podcast that discusses all areas of life, as well as featuring guest ministries to encourage viewers. One of the, one of the exciting things about ministry today is is that you don't have to wait till Sunday morning when your church gathers around and then you have this message burning in your soul and you finally get to deliver it. And then on Sunday afternoon, you're like, wow, I spent you know a month preparing that and now it's gone, never to be heard from again. We live in an amazing uh, time in history uh, as messengers of the gospel of Jesus Christ because you, know, you can put that on paper, you can put that in, uh, on a video format, you can have it on your website, you can have it on YouTube. And so we at World Challenge, uh, we have a team, um, some of them are in the room here with me right now, who are just, they have the heart of God, uh, but they have that uh, sense of, um, uh, of the ability to discern uh, what, you know, what God's doing in a, in, a, in a culture and in time and what, what resources are available. And so the team is put together, um, you know, we, have, we have social media that's going out constantly. And, it's, and it's, I'm flabbergasted. I can't believe it's like, you know, what used to be dozens of people might hear a message now it's into the tens of thousands of people that hear a message. It could be something as simple as an Instagram post and thousands and thousands of people uh, read it and the responses are, hey, that, that, that touched me, that moved me. That made me wanna go back to read you know, John chapter five again, because I, I didn't know that about that. You know? And so uh, simple things like that. Uh, but whether, and then our podcast is um, you know, touching some issues that are really important. Some of the deep issues of things that, that are really important for Christians to know, but oftentimes we only know them in surface. We only know sort of the, okay, I know there's a Trinity and there's the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, but I don't know how they relate. I don't know how they're one. I don't know how they're three. And so uh, the, some of the deeper issues, well, I know God is all powerful, but how does, uh, why is there still uh, sin and chaos in the world? If he's powerful, he could chant, well, you know, if he's good, why doesn't he? And so all these deep issues, that's on our podcast called the Gary Wilkerson Podcast, which I'm, I'm, I'm quite blessed to, see that um, touching people, people's lives. The stories of God's goodness and power that we hear from World Challenge partners every day are incredible. These testimonies speak to how a correct view of Christ and submission to God transform lives. Another major part of World Challenge's ministry has always been and continues to be reaching out to pastors. David Wilkerson had a heart for the burdens of church leaders, and Gary carries on this passion for blessing those who are spiritual leaders. When my father's pastoring in Times Square Church in New York City, he'd got a lot of invitations to uh, speak overseas. But at that point, he was not necessarily looking to do the crusade type thing that he did before, but he really wanted to influence uh, pastors. Um, seeing the impact of a healthy church in a place like New York City um, gave him a hope and a vision for healthy churches can really transform um, people around them, neighborhoods, cultures. And so, you know, as go the churches, so go the cities that they're in. And a healthy church brings a healthy gospel and brings health and hope and Christ to people's lives. I've been to different countries with World Challenge, both as a speaker and as, as a spectator. I've spectated sitting out there in, in Israel. I participated 
in everything uh, from countries all over Europe and uh, down in Central and South America. But I think the one that marks World Challenge and speaks to what World Challenge is about was the first conference I participated with Brother Dave and Gary Wilkerson. It was in the Middle East. It's the first time it's ever happened. I was doing outside stuff in the in the Amman Jordan area, but I watched pastors from Iraq, from Egypt, from um, from all over those areas that 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 were miracle pastors to see 13 Arabic nations. Um, at night, there'd be some 1,300 uh, people gathered right there in Amman, Jordan. Never, uh, it was never about money. It was nothing but all about generosity, pouring into them and giving these men and women um, who are literally on the front lines, who risk their life every day and watching David Wilkerson pour into them. That to me was what marks what marks World Challenge. And so the, you know, the vision was to, to go and empower pastors, to uh, implore them to get back into the Word of God, back into a holy way of living, don't compromise. And, and, um, and so he went and did a couple of pastor conferences. Then he invited me to come and join him. We did, um, I think, 70 countries together. Well, what a great time just seeing tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of pastors uh, come to the altar in prayer, weeping, just God, change the trajectory of my ministry. You know, give me a word to preach. You know, I don't want to get up there and be fluffy and light and foolish. I, you know, I want to, I want to come with a real living word of God. And Whether it's a struggling ministry, a struggling church, or just needing some refreshment in their own Christian walk, they. They got that from these conferences, and they they were very thankful for it. You know, I, I hear a lot of gratitude from from pastors for for the work that uh, World Challenge and my dad has done. I've seen it over and over again, um, and while everybody else would put it on the front pages of a newsletter, a magazine, a website, a web page, you will never hear about these things of all that has been invested in pastors and leaders around the world. That's what ma makes World Challenge. While everybody else is asking for money, um, World Challenge is giving it and investing it. That's why God entrusts World Challenge from the very beginning under Brother Dave's leadership and now under Gary's with so much. Our message is is, is wants, to, wants to bring the whole gospel to the whole man, uh, to the fullness of Christ, to the fullness of your life that your marriage would be affected, that your personal life would be affected, that your integrity would be affected, the way you run your business would be affected. Uh, that, you know, this all comes out of uh, a, a clear, um, uncompromised message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gary Wilkerson emphasizes that the gospel calls for reflection, but also requires action and obedience. The gospel is understanding the grace of a glorious God, the wrath that God has for sin, the sufficiency of Christ, the necessity of faith, and a longing for eternity. If we know and live the gospel, we will be real and transformed disciples, and never has transformation felt more needed in our world. Right now, the United States and the whole world are going through a heavy situation. The confirmed COVID-19 death toll has now surpassed one million, according to the Johns Hopkins count. And that, health officials caution, is likely an undercount. The nation erupted into scenes of chaos, violence, oh my God. and widespread destruction into the early morning hours. Dozens of American cities up in flame. COVID-19 has battered the global economy causing the worst recession since the Great Depression of the 1930s. The percent of Americans who identify with any religion has been on the decline for decades. And a recent Pew Research Center study has found the biggest generational drop-off is with millennials. I've been saying this, that God is going to use a generation, a new generation of people from the age of 29 to 60 
to really change, if we want to change here in the United States, the church cannot be quiet. And the preacher has to be honest and sincere and, and accept the facts where you belong. Don't try to be somebody else when God wants you to be yourself. Do what my spiritual father did when he received the call of God to come to New York. He could not resist the burden that he felt for New York, for this person like myself. The Holy Spirit have no respect to anyone. He always is there to use you. It's no money, it's no personality, although that's nice, look at me. But I surrender all. And you know what? He will take you. He will take that all, and he will make a man of God, a woman of God, a missionary. That's what life is all about. Jesus Christ. As World Challenge looks toward the future, we see God preparing His children to meet any storm. He is the unshakable foundation that our faith is based in, and Gary Wilkerson challenges believers to make sure they are building their lives on Christ. You know, there's something about that. I'm sure you've seen this too. You kind of know when you're in the presence of a man or a woman who's been with God. You know, they said that in the New Testament. You, uh, Peter and, and you, you know, you've been, these men have been with Jesus. And so, you know, that it's not, these, these men, um, you know, are hang out with uh, movie stars and they're, they're pastors. Oh, how cool. Are these men, you know, uh, you know, led this rock star to the Lord. Oh, how cool. Are they athletes go to their church? Oh, how cool. You know, no, it's like, no, they've been in the presence of Jesus. That's, that's what makes the difference. So the, I think the future of World Challenge will be to continue to attempt to dig deep into God, to present that message of God uh, to people that are hungry for God. That may not be well received uh, as we are in a um, slippery slope down into uh, agnosticism and um, um, aban total abandonment of the things of God. But, but at the end of this, what I would have to say is the gravitas and the weightiness of God far outweighs, is far superior and far more powerful than anything that culture would throw up against it. The gates of hell will not prevail. And I believe the Church of Jesus Christ is going to have a strong, holy remnant of people of God who are, um, who the world is hungry to say, you know, where did you get what you have? And nominal Christians are saying, I'm tired of playing games. I want, I, I want to get back to this, uh, to the ancient uh, boundaries that we once had in, in the family of God. And so I, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a small part of bringing that, and I want World Challenge to continue its message to be pure like that. As we celebrate 50 years of ministry, we look forward to the future with great anticipation of what God will do in His church. Thank you, World Challenge. Keep up your vision. You're doing a lot of great things. You are helping the poor. I see it with my own eyes. This is what they've always believed. God is going to multiply your blessing. Either right now, God is blessing. We're challenged. Why? Because the vision goes on and on and on, and God is in control. You know, I know that there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who at this moment right now live in freedom in Christ, whose lives have been transformed, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, because of the outreach of World Challenge Ministries. So God bless you, congratulations, keep on. I thank God for David Wilkerson, David and Gwen Wilkerson, and for all the people at World Challenge, now grown this a magnificent ministry with so many ministries. Dave has to be so proud, looking down at what his son Gary has done and, and manifesting the ministry and doing more now than ever. And we need, need support more now than ever. And that's coming in. We thank God for his faithfulness. And, and I just, the last word I just say is, thank God for World Challenge. Whether it's a pastor's conference, or whether it's feeding the poor, 
I am grateful for how God is using World Challenge and believing, believing and remembering the words of David Wilkerson, even, even telling, telling me one time, he says, when you, when you take care of the poor, God will take care of you. World Challenge, you have touched people all over the world and especially the poor. I'm so thankful for the legacy that you're leaving for generations to come. God bless you, World Challenge. There's a number of you perhaps that are watching that served a few years to many years to literally decades. And it's incumbent upon us that are here today to, to look back to you to say thank you because many of you formed the foundation. Uh, you worked in anonymity. You were uh, often unknown and yet no less loved, regarded, and uh, effective in your service to the Lord. And I, I just sense a keen uh, responsibility to say that we're so deeply appreciative. We do pray for you, and we pray the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he continue to make his face shine upon you, that in all your ways the Lord would be gracious to you, and that especially in the days we live today, that he would give you his divine peace so we say thank you and God bless you. All that God is doing, all that he has done, wouldn't be possible without your help. So I want to say thank you. Thank you for joining in prayer. Thank you for sending hard earned dollars. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for believing in the Lord in us, that we're, um, we don't take you for granted. We don't take your gifts for granted, and um, we are very, very thankful for you and for your help. Thank you to the, the donors and to the constituents, to everyone who's been praying for this ministry for so long. We know that that's how God moves, by in the response to the, the prayers and implanting the, the vision for this ministry. To come there's there's much to celebrate and all that god has done and all that he will continue to do thank you and we're so grateful to the generous donors that help make uh, this this a reality as well we couldn't do it without that and we never beg we don't plead we don't manipulate we don't do gimmicks we don't send up prayer cloths or holy water and say that i anointed it and it's going to touch you what we do is you know we just it's simple we preach jesus and if you're hungry then you'll get fed and Here's the mission he's given us. If he puts it on your heart to, 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 um, to give uh, uh, any kind of gift at all. Most of our gifts are, you know, kind of grandma's given us $5 or $10, and some of them will write us a letter saying, man, I'm so sorry, you know, I'm on, I'm on you know, government subsidies, and I just barely have enough to get all my food and pay my electric bill, so I don't have anything to give, but I'm praying for you. I'm like, you do have something to give. That's, that, that's amazing. You know, we, we could probably do this thing without a lot of money, but we can't do it without a lot of prayer. And so really, really grateful for those who, who pray and support World Challenge. Thank you for your prayers and support that have made all of this possible for 50 years.